This is Business Edge on New Central. I'm Tolu Lokwe at Dileru Balogun. Our headline story, mergers and acquisitions, a tool for expansion across Africa. Companies are still struggling to navigate the COVID-19 pandemic and its unprecedented disruption. Now, it looks like business executives are emboldened to replan and execute their mergers and acquisitions, as well as investment strategies. This is our focus today. Welcome. This is Business Edge. Now, despite a collapse in mergers and acquisitions in the first half of last year, deal making reached $2.32 trillion in the second half and transactions rebounded by 123% between the first and second quarter of 2020. According to a report produced by Ernst & Young, with the advent of many vaccines, business leaders expect a return to pre-pandemic levels of profitability in 2021, 2021 that is about 23%, and about 20 about 44 percent rather in 2022 while executives are also scanning their geographical footprints for potential growth now what do we mean by mergers and acquisition not long ago in nigeria when access bank bought intercontinental bank in 2013 that was a merger the combination between exxon and mobile in 1998 to form exxon mobile was also a merger in each of these examples the two companies combined to become one entity but when Stripe paid $200 million for Paystack in 2020, that was an acquisition. Both entities remained after the investment. The difference is that now Stripe owns Paystack. Another example would be how Canal Plus acquired Rock Film Studios from Iroko TV two years ago. That was an acquisition. Both Canal Plus and Rock Studios remained separate entities. So basically in a nutshell, that's the difference between mergers and acquisitions. But both mergers and acquisitions, or rather M&As, involve one company buying ownership in another company. Globally, the numbers for M&As have been on the decline since they peaked in 2017 with 52,740 deals. Joining me on the show is a corporate lawyer, Dara Lalei, from the law chambers of Adek Petun, Caxton, Martins, Agbor, and Shegun. Dara, thank you so much for being our guest on Business Edge. Welcome. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Thank you. So before we get into why people may be looking into mergers and acquisition, acquisitions and the likes, let's talk about why the peak has gone down. The peak didn't go down because of the pandemic. But as I said earlier, the peak was around 2017 with over 52,000 deals. But since that time, it seems maybe the business environment has not been so favorable to mergers and acquisitions. Or what would you say? Why have we seen a decline even before the pandemic came into the picture? I would say that the decline happened even from 2016. Bear in mind, that was when there was a global financial crisis and foreign exchange became difficult to get. Mm. And there was a very difficult economic terrain in Nigeria. You had a lot of investors not sure of the government policies, not sure of when they would change, what form they would take. And as a result, it reduced investors' confidence in the market. So during that 2016, 2017 time, you found you would find that a lot of companies were not willing to take the risk of investing in Nigeria just because they were just not sure of the foreign exchange terrain. And again, foreign exchange is very difficult to get then and even more so now. So all these factors contributed to investors not willing to take that risk of coming into Nigeria and or even Nigerian investors coming together and acquiring companies just because the regulatory hurdles, foreign exchange, mm -hmm. compliance, and was just too difficult. So did government take note of all these difficulties in terms of what those who were looking at foreign investments, maybe not necessarily in terms of mergers and acquisitions, but the difficulties of those who are looking for foreign investments, who are definitely going to be wanting to repatriate their dollars or foreign exchange? Did they take note of these difficulties? Did they take note of what the market was telling them and adjust accordingly? I mean, to an ex a certain extent, they did. The, there was there's the concept of the certificate of capital importation, and this was now made electronic just for ease of investment. But all these things are still not enough when the investors do not have confidence in the markets. The CBN, on a very frequent basis, comes out with different regulations, 
sometimes contradictory, sometimes just out of the blues. And when you have an investor and you want to enter into a market or just consolidate your assets within a market, you need to know that the laws are behind you. So Hello, Dara. All right, technology is just one of those things that finds a way to show itself when you least expect it. But we will, of course, continue this conversation. Dara, I believe, is back with us right now um, as we're looking at mergers and uh, acquisitions. So, Dara, are you back with us? All right, so Dara, we can see you. Yes, Great. I am. Yes, I am. All right, so I wanted you to wrap up on that. So we were saying that if you're a foreign investor and you're looking in, having a regulatory environment where there's a flip-flop in policy, there's just different policy from day to day, week to week, is something that would definitely scare you away. Anything else you want to add to that? I think another thing I would like to look at is that the another, um, should I say, another constriction to the investor's entering the Nigerian market or investors within the Nigerian market was just the, the, the plethora of laws that governed it, that governed mergers and acquisitions. Or if I come into Nigeria, there was the tax regime, there was the um, regulatory compliance, getting compliance, um, getting content from different regulatory agencies, all that comes together and just reduces investors' confidence in the market. So I would say tax is another big, plays another big role in investors and homegrown Nigerian investors from playing in the markets in Nigeria. I actually remember you mentioning this, our last conversation about uh, some of the overlap in terms of the laws, many laws under different acts, under different agencies doing the same things and having um, a tax structure that actually is looking at multiple taxation and not just even double, but actual multiple taxation for a company. So obviously it's a very sore point for you and one that you hope that those who are in charge of regulation take a note at. So let's get into this a bit more. So many companies actually stretch their corporate expansion beyond board how easy is it to do any of this in regards to more mergers and acquisitions? How easy is this to do with varying legal frameworks and regulations from country to country beyond your normal habitats? Well, I would say ordinarily it should be quite easy or maybe easy is in the word. It should be a streamlined process. Mm. But if we're looking at Nigeria, looking at the focus of Nigeria and foreign mergers, the FCCPC, the Federal Competition and Consumer Protection Act and Commission. It's a new agency. It's just started. It's relatively young. So getting cooperation from its other agencies in other countries can be very difficult. Now, the FCCP merger review guidelines provide that if it's an international company, but the transaction, the merger transaction has a local nexus, mm -hmm. it will be looked at by the FCCPC Commission. But the problem with that now, again, is that there are thresholds. Mm. What happens, the thresholds are 1 billion Naira, if it's a combination of two companies or combination of undertakings, or 500 billion Naira, if it's a target, sorry, 1 trillion Naira, if it's a combination, and 500 billion or million, if it's a, um, if it's a target, you, I want two companies want to, there's a target undertaking. Okay. But what happens if the thresholds are not complied with. Mm -hmm. Despite that, the, uh, the commission has the power. Once it identifies that there's going to be a substantial prevention and lessening of competition, the commission does have the power to look behind, behind the fact that, okay, the thresholds have not been complied with and still see, does this combination, does it fall within our ambit? They have that power. But like I said, they're young agency. Mm -hmm. So without the cooperation of their international body, their international counterparts, it's going to be very difficult to enforce a merger with a Nigerian component that happens on the grounds or the soil of another country. Okay. In other jurisdictions, the UK, the US, they've been in existence for such a long time. They have this down, they have, they've, in fact, other countries look to their model. Their laws are generally integrated. So what is competition in the UK is similar to competition in the US. So in terms of the substantive provisions of the law, it's easier. But in Nigeria, there are all sorts of factors mitigating. There are so many aspects of the Federal Competition and Consumer Protection Act, which have not been streamlined and has led to confusion such that if there's a foreign component to a merger, 
that has impact in Nigeria, it would be harder to enforce the foreign aspects of that merger overseas. Okay, so you talk about a few of these things that are leading to confusion. Let's highlight, looking at the FCC, FCCPC Act and, of course, the agency now set up, just highlight maybe two or three of those issues that you think really need to be identified and addressed as quickly as possible so that the intent behind the commission, the intent behind the act, can continue to be what it is. Okay, so for instance, I said if it's a if it's a if there's a foreign element, yeah. maybe to a company abroad, but that has subsidiaries playing in Nigeria, or the target undertaking is a company that has a lot of its operations in Nigeria. The threshold is 500 million for the target undertaking, or where it's a combination, one billion naira. Mm -hmm. But what happens when the threshold isn't met? But at the same time. The target undertaking is a company that is an active player in Nigeria. Mm. That needs to be clarified. Mm. It, it can't be either or. It needs to be both. It's a company with an active, um, an active structure in Nigeria or plays actively in Nigeria. And at the same time, a company that has satisfied the threshold requirements. Okay. It has to be clarified. Okay. That's one. Then there's the inside, there's the... Um, there's the issue of the fact that the FCCPC has, even though the FCCPC has made it clear that when there is, in terms of competition law, even when it applies to sectors, when there is an overlap between the provisions of other sector-specific laws, it has concurrent jurisdiction, and it would even trump the provisions of the other sectors. That hasn't been tested. Kama, the Company and Allied Matters Act 2020, also gives Kama powers in terms of mergers. Mm. There's still the N National Nigerian Communications Act. That gives the NCCC, NCCC, um, NCC com um, powers in terms of mergers for telecommunications. So there hasn't actually been a testing of what happens if there is an issue that two telecoms companies wants to combine. Yeah. And the FCC comes up and says, I have jurisdiction. But the, the FCP, FCCPC also says, I have jurisdiction. But that issue has not been tested. Mm -hmm. So we need not only, it goes beyond what the act says, the act says one thing, but in practice, what will happen when these agencies come head to head and are both claiming rights of way over competition in their particular sectors? Okay. So that's another issue that needs to be clarified by practical application. Then... Finally, another issue is the fact that the FCCPC Act, or F the Act, I'll just call it the Act, it gives them, um, it allows companies that are under its ambit to grant a waiver such that it can interact with other competition agencies in other countries. But again, what happens if the com companies do not want to grant this waiver? Yes. It's not compulsory. Mm -hmm. So you have a situation whereby two jurisdictions are being affected, Nigeria and maybe, let's say, Canada or the US, but no waiver is granted. So that limits the competition agency's powers of enforcement to go into another jurisdiction yeah. and try and apply its regulatory authority to the laws of another jurisdiction. Like this is not Interpol that, you know, they've all signed up to yeah. some scheme that, oh, please um, regulatory agencies will cooperate against each other. So that's the difficulty. Those are the three difficulties I can think of. And those are interesting ones. And hopefully those in the regulatory space involving this will be able to identify. And I do believe one thing, when we have laws and frameworks, tests are very, very necessary. So I'm very sure many of us will be looking forward to see how some of these issues are tested. Let's talk about shareholders now. We know they're typically if not at 99.9%, .9%, they are the deciding factor that gives authorization for a company to take over another or to merge with another. And oftentimes there's consultation and sometimes there's not. Um, can there be regulation? Is there regulation involving how shareholders do their activities when it comes to mergers and acquisitions regarding this new framework? Oh, definitely, definitely. And now I have to even talk about Kama has also introduced new provisions okay. that basically, with relation to mergers and acquisitions, they give the shareholders even more power and they clarify their power. So you have situations whereby you cannot take, if, if there's a potential merger, unless the shareholders are majority in majority in agreement mm -hmm. with the, share, the potential merger and acquisition, I believe it's about 
50% of the shareholders or even more, maybe 75%, if they are not in agreement, then there is no way that that merger can take place. They have to come. And then there's also the power of if there's um, a potential merger, mm. the shareholders also have to agree to have the the the, the, the right, it's called the right of first refusal. Okay. The shareholders selling their shares have to first grant the shareholders that are still remaining the power, the right of first refusal to buy those shares before, before giving yeah. it outside. Exactly, mm. exactly. So when you look at all these, and then you have the power of the court-appointed meetings. Yes. That protects minority shareholders who can always go to court and tell the court, and I'm using colloquial language now, tell the court that this is not something we agree with. Mm -hmm. This is something the court needs to look into. And the court will order a stay until all the facts have been re reviewed. And then if the court is satisfied, then the merger can take place. Otherwise, now, because of all these things, all these um, provisions rather of the Companies and Allied Matters Act 2020, it's not the powers of minority shareholders are very much more protected, mm -hmm. unlike before. Okay. So when you look at all these things in line with what the Federal Competition and Consumer Protection Act already provides for in terms of the overarching rights of consumers, you can see that there's a new regime and that new regime is ultimately consumer protection, increasing confidence in the markets and ensuring that the structure of the government agencies and their substantive laws are supporting this consumer protection in the form of the shareholders and in the form of increasing market confidence. All right, so Dara, we're going to take a very quick time out here. Um, we'll continue this conversation and get a bit deeper into what the regulations look at, particularly in line with um, mergers and acquisitions in terms of making them easier. Is there any potential for a merger or acquisition to actually be reversed after all the I's have been dotted and the T's have been crossed? We'll get into those questions right after this. This is Business Edge right here on New Central. Stay with us. And time, unfortunately, is not on our side. My guest is still with me, Dara Lalehin. She is a corporate lawyer. So, Dara, very quickly, can a merger or acquisition actually be reversed? And I'm not talking about in the stages where the courts may have been involved, minority shareholders and things like that. But after the I's have been dotted and the T's have been crossed, have you ever seen something like that happen? Well, the Federal Competition and Consumer Protection Act does allow, does um, provide for situations where a merger can be revoked. And that is especially in terms of a small merger. Bear in mind that small mergers aren't actually required to seek the approval of the commission. But in instances whereby looking at after the, all the facts, once the small merger has actually been completed, if the commission looks at what we call in corporate law, looks behind the veil, pierces mm -hmm. the veil, and sees that, wait, this business combination actually has a merger effect and is reducing competition. Mm -hmm. Yes. This business complete combination is actually, it's, it's been in existence for quite a while. But then the commission has that power to basically require the parties to come to it and make a submission okay. to the commission about the, all the facts of the merger. So yes, and if the commission discovers that, yes, this actually is less in competition, they can actually prohibit the already existing merger. Okay. But larger mergers no large merger can occur without the approval of the commission. Okay. So there's no, um, it's very unlikely for you to have a situation whereby the commission would, after reviewing all the facts to a large merger, later come back and say, oh, we made a mistake. This, we approved it, but it's, it, it, it's, it wasn't meant wrong. to be approved. Yeah. And that situation changes. And I would have to add, the FCCPC now looks at a definition of a merger or a business combination is where they look at a series of transactions over a period of two years. So if small steps were taken, successive events were taken in a period of two years, which are not subject to mandatory filing on their own, mm. but when you combine them together, together in that two-year period, yes, the commission can, after the merger or the business combination, the commission, commission can look at all the facts in that two-year period and require that 
the parties either come back to it and submit new information about the business operations or revoke the merger. But okay. typically, it would only apply to small mergers because those are the only business combinations or acquisition change in control situations whereby they have already been allowed to operate without the commission's approval. So the commission can go back and revoke that approval, even though it wasn't initially granted. All right, Dara, we're going to have to end this conversation here for now, but there's a lot more. What makes a company look for a merger or an acquisition? What's making someone look for someone to buy them, whether it's in a good situation or bad? We could have a white knight situation or a black knight situation takeover as it may be. And of course, you have to consider how easy this framework is actually going to make uh, corporate situations in Nigeria. But that will have to be a conversation for another day. Dara Laleni, thank you so much for joining me on Business Edge. We look forward to having you back. Thank you very much. Thank All right, you. Fantastic. Sure. All right. You know what we do up next is NC for the watch as we wrap things up and we get straight into it with South Africa. Now, despite several calls to let the national carrier fall into administration, the government in South Africa has yet again given more money to save South African airways. Now, the Ministry of Public Enterprises announced that the airline received another 5 billion rand, about $342 million. This money is part of a relief package aimed at rescuing the airline. From the southern part of the continent to the eastern, the Ethiopian Communications Authority has whittled down the list from 12 companies that had expressed interest in entering the, com uh, the country's telecommunications markets. Now, firms will be required to submit their technical and financial bids by April the 5th, moved up from a previous deadline of March 5th. Rwanda has secured a $200 million facility from the African Export-Import Bank to support the country's preparations to host the Fund for Export Development in Africa. The funding was announced by the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Vincent Buruta, as he recently addressed the lower house of parliament during a virtual sitting. And finally, venture capital firm Uncovered Fund has launched a $15 million fund to back early stage startups in Africa. The fund, expected to close by June this year, is looking to invest between $50,000 and $500,000 in African startups, seed and series A stages, working with local entrepreneurs to create sustainable businesses. And NC4 to Watch brings us to the end of the edition of this Business Edge. Thank you so much for joining us. Follow us on social media. We are at New Central TV. Head to our website, www.newcentral.africa. And don't forget, you can download our mobile app on Google Play Store and Apple App Store, as well as watching us live on Star Time Channel 274. Until I come your way again, my name is Solulakwe Adelaru Balogun. <laughs>